I'm Edward Rock. I teach, I teach here. I teach some of you corporations. Uh, and it's my great pleasure to, to welcome you all to this Latham and Watkins forum. Uh, we, have a, we have an absolutely spectacular panel to discuss uh, what is really the, the, the most important issue in corporate governance today, which is for whom is the corporation managed, the question of corporate purpose. Uh, the panel, uh, which I'll briefly introduce, is to my immediate left is somebody who should be well known to many of you. It's Marty Lipton, a class of 1955 here at the law school, so approaching his 65th reunion uh, this spring. Uh, Marty told me on the way down here that he was in the second class, uh, second NYU class in this building. Uh, so the building hasn't been here forever, uh, but it's been here a long time. Uh, and in addition to having taught here for many, many years as an adjunct and now back teaching as an adjunct, uh, Marty's day job has been with a, with a well-known firm uh, in the Midtown, uh, up in Midtown, Wachtell, Lipton, Rosen, and Katz, uh, which is, as I hope all of you know, is, is genuinely an NYU law firm in the sense that Wachtell, Lipton, Rosen, and Katz were all law students here who were friends here who a few years after graduating decided to start a firm together. Uh, to Marty's left is Katie Sudol, who is law school class of 92 um, and is a partner at Simpson Thatcher uh, in the corporate group. And as a partner in Simpson Thatcher in the corporate group, inevitably, she has done deals for Blackstone for KKR, uh, as well as for a bunch of other clients, uh, and has been very active in prior to being in the New York, New York office, was in the Hong Kong office. And to Katie's left is Tony Welchers, who you should all recognize from the beautiful portrait that you pass as you, as you come into the building. And Tony is the immediate past chair of our board of trustees, uh, but for our purposes, uh, Tony is the founder, was the founder of a very successful healthcare company called AmeriChoice, uh, which he founded in 1989 and then sold to United Health in 2002 and then continued his business career uh, with United Health. Uh, and now is doing a variety of other things, is a director of a variety of major corporations. And so we have a variety of perspectives here. Um, I want to start with just a few words of background for the business roundtable letter that got garnered so much attention uh, recently. In 1997, in 1997, the business roundtable issued a statement that opened with the following words. The business roundtable wishes to emphasize that the principal objective of a business corporation is to generate economic returns to its owners. And they go on to say that while there are many who contest this proposition and believe that corporations should serve uh, various stakeholders, uh, the Business Roundtable does not view these two positions as being in conflict but it sees a need for clarification of the relationship between these two perspectives. It is in the long-term interest of stockholders for a corporation to treat its employees well, to serve its customers well, to encourage its suppliers to con continue to supply it, to honor its debts, and to have a reputation for civic responsibility. But, they then go on to say, in the business roundtable view, the paramount duty of management and of boards of directors is to the corporation's stockholders. The interests of other stakeholders are relevant as a derivative of the duty to stockholders. The notion that a board must somehow balance the interests of stockholders against the interests of other stakeholders fundamentally misconstrues the role of directors. 20 years later, in a very different uh, social and economic setting, the Business Roundtable 
then revisits this question and in its recent statement uh, made the following statement. While each of our individual companies serves its own corporate purpose, we share a fundamental commitment to all of our stakeholders. We commit to delivering value to our customers, investing in our employees, dealing fairly and ethically with our suppliers, supporting the communities in which we work, generating long-term value for shareholders. They go on to say each of our <coughs> stakeholders is essential. We commit to deliver value to all of them for the future success of our companies, our communities, and our country. What's so striking, of course, in the Business Roundtable statement is there's no statement on parallel to the 1997 statement as to whose interest, if any, is paramount. It doesn't say no interest is paramount, but it doesn't say whether any interest is, is paramount. That, as you know, that statement got a tremendous amount of publicity. Uh, the Council of Institutional Investors, which represents many public and private pension funds, came out almost immediately with a statement in response, uh, contesting the Business Roundtable statement and essentially endorsing the 1997 approach. And Elizabeth Warren, six weeks or so later, responded by letter to uh, Jamie Dimon, the chair of the Business Roundtable, uh, in which she points to her Accountable Capitalism Act and asks Jamie Dimon and the Business Roundtable to be more specific on precisely what they intend to do to implement these words that they have in their August 2019 statement. So this is a set of questions. This is an issue that now is, is very much part of the corporate governance debate a debate that spans corporate law, finance, and management, and politics. Corporate governance sits at the intersection of those three areas. And this is a topic that is being discussed everywhere on all three, across all three dimensions. Um, and we have a, a panel that is uh, wonderfully well situated to, to cast light on this. So I want to um, open, really, uh, with the general question, uh, what are we to make of this, this business roundtable statement? And start with Katie. Katie, viewed as a statement of the law, is the business roundtable statement accurate, surprising, worth commenting on from a legal perspective? What's included? What's excluded? I think as a matter of law and the business roundtable itself, actually because, and I've heard informally, did not expect such a storm of publicity about this statement um, came out and also gave some follow-up um, responses to questions that came out uh, where they, I think, tried to run the gap a little bit as to whether this was changing the law. In my personal view, if you look at Delaware law, Delaware law remains the same which is that boards of directors need to justify what they do in terms of whether it is maximizing long-term value for the owners of the business, the stockholders of the business. But when you drill down on that, and I think the members of the business roundtable and many commentators have agreed, and I agree with this as well, there's room within that. What does that mean versus some of the stakeholders that are listed in the statement? And I think, just to be clear, to focus on Delaware, which is where the majority of um, you know, US corporations are incorporated, Delaware does not have a constituency statute or a stakeholder statute. Um, many states do, where they specifically reference employees or customers or other constituents. Delaware does not have that. However, as I think most of the people in this room know, Delaware has the business judgment rule. And there is a lot of latitude given to directors within the business judgment rule. In my view, the statement is not inconsistent with the state of the law in that directors do have the ability, in complying with their fiduciary duties, 
to look at all aspects of the corporation, to look at employees, to look at customers, to look at whether they're using ethical suppliers as well as you know these ESG issues, which have become major issues for corporate boards and things that their stockholders are extremely focused on. That's what the majority of shareholder proposals have been in the last five to 10 years. I think that's consistent with Delaware law, but only to the extent that it is ultimately viewed by the directors as tied back into making it a better business for the ultimate benefit of the corporation's owners. Tony, uh, you've run, you've built a business. Uh, back, in 19, back in 2009, Jack Welch, the legendary CEO at, at GE, less legendary now than he once was, uh, famously declared that shareholder value is the dumbest idea in the world. Shareholder value, he said, is a result, not a strategy. Your main constituencies are your employees, your customers, and your products. Managers and investors should not set share price increases as their overarching goal. Short-term profits should be allied with an increase in the long-term value of a company. What do you make of the business roundtable statement from, a, from the perspective of somebody who's run a business? One, I was surprised that it, um, it was unique in its statement, um, meaning this. It's hard for me to understand how anyone could build a successful enterprise thinking that your sole obligation is to focus on one cohort. It's been my experience in building businesses, you build them as a team with a broad-based group of constituencies. And it's very easy, near term, to make decisions that will appear to protect the long term, generally short term decisions do not yield long term results. And not recognizing core constituencies, if you will, stakeholders, in those calculations is a critical error. Because at the end of the day, you're competing against people and you're, you're trying to attract people. You know, I, the businesses that I've, I have built always rely on other people to help us be successful. And in return for that relationship, we always thought about them. And I guess because much of my time has been in healthcare, fundamentally, you have to think about a broad group of constituencies and not just shareholders. Shareholders can be rewarded for value but there are a lot of other metrics to achieve that value. Marty, you've, you've been a leader in trying to get people to rethink uh, their, their views of corporate purpose, of the role of the corporation, of the role of, of shareholders. How do you see the Business Roundtable statement fitting in to the public conversations over corporate governance? Well, obviously, the business roundtable statement is reflective of what I would call current social and political thinking. Okay. Now, putting aside what the law might be, uh, clearly the business roundtable uh, uh, definition of purpose of a corporation is one designed to meet the current concerns with respect to many different issues, but the two primary issues are one, climate, that uh, the, uh, it's no longer in any way acceptable for a corporation to not uh, reflect the concern with climate and the concern with carbon and all of the other things that relate to, to climate. The second, uh, and equally significant really, is inequality. Um, that it's not possible for a corporation today to not reflect concern, one, for the absolute wages of its employees, 
to the training and retraining that is a product of technological disruption. Three, uh, health care. And four is retirement. And uh, in fact, uh, corporations since the end of the second war have basically offloaded each of those uh, areas of employee concern, either on the government or just on the employees themselves. So that um, one of the causes of uh, populist um, discontent is the uh, actual decline in effective real income of the average working person in the United States over the last 35 odd years. So uh, in large measure, no government can long tolerate that. And uh, uh, that's why you get changes in government, not just here, but um, uh, the Brexit, Brexit situation in the UK. And, uh, basically, um, in uh, Western economies, uh, is reflective of uh, a disproportionate share of corporate profits going to shareholders rather than to uh, employees and other stakeholders. So that um, if you step back and look at it from a societal uh, standpoint, uh, it's clear that shareholder primacy and maximizing value for shareholders will not stand up. Now, there are those of us who think that they do not have to stand up because that was never the uh, intention of the corporate law in Delaware. It's nowhere in the corporate law of Delaware. Uh, and that the uh, statements in some cases um, that uh, would indicate that the Delaware courts agree with it are really dictum and not decisions in those cases. I, for one, believe that the law of Delaware is that the purpose of a corporation is to run a successful business and uh, to run it in a way that increases um, its worth over a period of time. Not maximize its value for shareholders, uh, not maximize its value at the expense of stakeholders other than shareholders, but that the board of directors has a fiduciary duty and must use its business judgment to allocate among the stakeholders uh, of the corporation. And uh, that in undertaking that allocation, they have to keep in mind that the business should continue to be successful and that the business should continue to grow its value. But beyond that, uh, it's their reasonable business judgment that determines the allocation among the stakeholders. So I want to I want to explore the, the legal side, but before we do, I want to stay on the political side for uh, for a bit. What is the th thought of as a political intervention or political statement? What is what do you take the business roundtable statement to be? Re responding to and trying to accomplish? You're asking me? Yeah. Well, I think it's um, basically responding to two things. General pressures with respect to um, the purpose of a corporation. Keep in mind that this issue is not brand new this year. Uh, it uh, dates back, in fact, to the 1960s when Milton Friedman first came up with the concept of shareholder primacy. 
and uh, the debate between uh, two noble laureates, um, uh, Friedman on one hand and Joseph Stiglitz on the other hand has been going on. Uh, all of this stems from the acceptance um, um, by the University of Chicago group of economists in the 60s and 70s of some theories that had developed uh, in academia in Austria. Austria and um, it reached its climax in 1970 when uh, Milton Friedman had an op-ed in the New York Times Magazine basically say that uh, the sole social purpose of a corporation is to maximize value for shareholders. There are several different uh, variations of that, but I think it's a fair, a fair statement of what the Friedman view has been. The most important aspect is not the exactly what the statement is or what the boundaries are or so on or what the law is. It's what happened in the business schools and the law schools after that statement was made. Uh, and in large measure, uh, throughout uh, the US and, and pretty much throughout the Western world, it caught on like wildfire. And the, every business school was graduating MBAs, knowing that their job was to maximize profits for shareholders. And it was rare um, that um, law schools were teaching stakeholder uh, governance rather than uh, shareholder privacy. Um, and uh, the, uh, the real difference from an economic standpoint, take uh, Friedman and add over here uh, um, Eugene Farmer, who developed the efficient market theory, another Nobel laureate. Uh, Michael Jensen, who was at Chicago and at Harvard, who developed the uh, theory of agency cost um, uh, that um, basically picked up from Adolf Burley in 1932 that in large measure shareholders had to have the power uh, as uh, the owners uh, to uh, tell management, the directors, how to run the company so as to avoid management taking advantage of the shareholders. So those three economic theories uh, became dominant, essentially. Um, in academia and in the business schools, and therefore as a practical matter. Uh, there was very little uh, concern. Uh, there were no stakeholder statutes uh, uh, in existence um, this period. When the takeover activity started to increase dramatically in the 70s and 80s, suddenly the issue became, what are we doing here? Uh, do uh, uh, we run a company for the shareholders or do we uh, run a company uh, to continue to have a business? Do we just sell a company anytime somebody comes along and wants to buy it and so on? So this big debate started on shareholder permissive and stakeholders I got into the debate in 1979. I wrote an article uh, uh, um, uh, urging, pushing, uh, saying that stakeholder uh, governance was the appropriate uh, uh, legal approach to it and so on. This debate just continued on, I won't go into details, uh, through the 80s, 90s. Uh, uh, we had uh, and, and some, yet and yet something prompted the business roundtable to change its position. Was well, it, was it changed it, its position several, several times. times. But was it is, is it is it Elizabeth Warren's accountable? Capitalism? Well, we're, get, we're, I, I getting, think, we're getting to that. Yeah. We're getting to that. 
I think before you get you know, there, when, when I think about before you it, get there, you have to hit Sarbanes-Oxley, uh, SEC, New York Stock Exchange, governance uh, rules, uh, Dodd-Frank, and um, um, all of the responses to the scandals um, of um, the end, end of the century and um, um, WorldCom and Enron and so on, and most significantly, 2008 and the financial crisis and so on. So uh, here you are, and, the, and this debate is now continuing. Along around 2013, 2014, uh, some of the people in the business started to get worried, uh, particularly uh, the index funds. Uh, they were thriving. Funds were moving into their control. Uh, they managed for very low uh, expenses. So, uh, and, um, uh, they uh, uh, were worried that they were going to be blamed for short-termism and activism and such on, and they started to issue letters proclaiming their um, adherence to sustainable long-term investment and to ESG factors and so on. And um, nothing much happened as a result of that. Nothing changed as a result of it. But they built up a little record of, yes, we're in, in favor of it. The, Council of Institutional Investors even said, yes, we're concerned about climate also, but did absolutely nothing to reverse the pressure on companies to maximize uh, their earnings. Um, and then um, all of a sudden, uh, um, uh, Washington became aware of the depth of the problem and the political implications of problem. And uh, concurrent with uh, Elizabeth Warren's uh, Accountable Capitalism Act, you had Marco Rubio um, uh, filing a bill to restrain corporate uh, buybacks of shares, and even more important, issuing a position paper uh, advocating uh, uh, long-term investment and rejecting the concept of stakeholder privacy, literally and effectively arguing against uh, stakeholder privacy. Well, when you have something like that happen, people will step back and say, hey, there's a problem here, we better, uh, you know, adjust our thinking to deal with this problem. That's where Tony, I you think want to we got to? Yeah, I, I think the way, the way I think about it is, is this. Government has deferred um, around issues of governance for the most part. And a coalition has now emerged across a broad political spectrum, Elizabeth Warren only being one indicator of that, and that the message is clear. If corporations do not embrace a operating philosophy that goes beyond just themselves and their shareholders, there will be government intervention. And that this is causing corporations to take a step back and say, how do I best demonstrate that I bring value add to the society above and beyond the fact that I know how to operate a profitable enterprise? And the other part of that is I want to see the best evidence that you're doing those things. I want to see some real metrics around those things. So part and parcel of this is ways of measuring how things are changing. And I think for everyone um, to not take this moment in time seriously and, or think about it as a passing fancy is a critical error. And those operating major enterprises put their enterprises at risk because there are levers that the government can utilize to materially affect your ability to have a successful enterprise. And I'll just throw a few out just to think about. 
when you think about early stage investing in um, pharma, think about NIH. Absent National Institute of Health, there would be no big pharma in America because there's not a single corporation in America that could afford the level of investment to bring new drugs to market. Think about fracking. Whatever you think about fracking, one way or the other, the reality is out of the Department of Energy, going back into the early 90s, that's where the early investments in the technology were made. May not like the defense industry, but DARPA has led the way in a whole host of things many of you utilize in your life, including the internet. Without the R&D tax credits, a lot of the investments and innovation wouldn't exist. So government is now saying, I want to see you, the corporation, demonstrate in tangible ways that you recognize there is an obligation that goes beyond just your shareholders and shareholder value. I will say parenthetically, if you want to have a sustainable enterprise, you better take into account all of your constituencies and not just one. Let me, let me follow up on that and, and press you a little bit. So in the 1960s, late 60s, the debate was over corporate social responsibility. And it's that debate that Milton Friedman in the famous New York Times Magazine article in 1970 called The Social Responsibility of Business is to Increase Its Profits. It's that debate that he was entering. And he said the following. He said, whether blameworthy or not, the use of the cloak of social responsibility and the nonsense spoken in its name by influential and prestigious businessmen does clearly harm the foundations of a free society. I have been impressed time and again by the schizophrenic character of many businessmen. They are capable of being extremely far-sighted and clear-headed in matters that are internal to their business. They are incredibly short-sighted and muddle-headed in matters that are outside their business, but affect the possible survival of business in general. This short-sightedness is strikingly exemplified in the calls from many businessmen for wage and price guidelines or controls or income policies. There is nothing that could do more in a brief period to destroy a market system and replace it by a centrally controlled system than effective governmental control of prices and wages. In other words, what Friedman was saying in, the 19, in 1970 was that these statements by business committing to what was then the, the, the dominant idea for social responsibility were jeopardizing the core bases of a market economy. He wasn't, he was recognizing it as a political intervention. His position was it was a bad political intervention. And my question is, do we think that the business roundtable, taken as a political intervention, recognizing the populist period we live in, uh, recognizing the duties of business to society, do we think it's a good political intervention, that it will be effective in forestalling uh, mandatory regulation that businesses would prefer not to be subject to, or, and the way I think about it is, or having issued the statement in August, the business roundtable statement, fast forward to August of 2021, when President Warren gives an address saying, <laughs> saying, look back at what you said in August of 2019. We're in agreement that business has to serve all these different constituencies. What have you done since? It's time for mandatory regulation. Do you worry that this is ineffective or even counterproductive as a political intervention? I worry the failure to act allows extremists to be front and center. The realities around climate, income inequality are global in nature. And if we don't bring the entire society together to tackle them, then the extremists will dominate. So I think it's very, very important for corporations to be fully engaged in a discussion because there's a vital role that the corporation has played over centuries in moving the ball forward. And to capitulate to extremists 
for them to set the bar, I believe, is a critical error. Katie, what are you hearing from your clients? I, I, I agree with that. And I mean, sort of in response to a lot of your questions about how did this come about, look, we do have extreme income inequality. And I think a lot of these corporations were looking at very strong voices in politics and a lot of the American public saying, OK, maybe unemployment is where it is, but you look at how much American wages have increased compared to CEO pay, even after what happened um, you know, during the global financial crisis, and now look where it is back again. That's unfair. People worrying about what's happening with the environment, people worrying about jobs going overseas, ethical supply chains, and this, these companies feeling like they needed to be responsive. I think some of it, again, is not to be too cynical, but also tied back to their own survival. And the fact that investors do care about it, and, one, and that it goes to the value of the company if the general public, which may be your, investor, your investors or your customers, believe you're an unethical corporation because either you're cheating your employees, you're polluting your environment or your community, um, or otherwise you know, not being a good corporate citizen, I think a lot of the answer to that might be before you swing to just full regulation that may or may not be effective, and some may, is also a lot of people are talking about just more disclosure. And a lot of my clients are very focused on ESG issues in terms of at least having almost all major corporations and investment firms now have quite strong ESG policies that they do do checks on. Does that mean they only do solely, you know, environmentally sound investing? That may not always be the case, but people do have the policies. I think there's been a lot of discussion about whether mandatory SEC disclosures should now include ESG matters, and some companies do that voluntarily anyway because also they see their stockholders as well as their employees and their customer base caring about these issues. And, and when your clients consult with you, A, about what the business roundtable statement means, B, what its implications are legally, and C, what its implications are for them as a business, what are you telling them? Are, are you, are you, uh, what, what's the advice that you're giving? I, I think generally the advice that we are giving and that many people in sort of corporate big firm practice are giving are that this statement did not purport to be a change in the law necessarily. You know, the law, and, and obviously there are many interpretations of what uh, is within uh, directors' fiduciary duties and how they exercise those duties properly and what um, stakeholders they can take into account in making the final determination, but that, you know, ultimately the law hasn't changed because of this statement. What may change, though, is what we know directors and when we're advising boards what they're thinking about. You know, people, these corporations and these individual directors and individual officers or corporations are worried about are they doing the right thing either, you know, as a general moral sense, but also from a fiduciary duty and legal perspective. Are they complying with their fiduciary duties if they're not looking at ESG issues, if they're not looking at broader issues? Again, I think legally we are saying generally it's ultimately tied back to fiduciary duties which relate to duties to shareholders which don't necessarily mean only maximizing val shareholder value, but taking that into account as, as part of it. So, so Elizabeth, Elizabeth Warren's letter is in some sense explicitly asking firms to make it clear what they're going to do to implement the, the sentiments reflected in the, in the business roundtable statement. And there are now a variety of proposals out there for what firms might do. Uh, in a recent paper, uh, Leo Strine, the now, just now retired Chief Justice of Delaware, had a set of suggestions, one of which, for instance, was to have a committee on the board for employee issues. Uh, just if we have an audit committee and a non-gov committee and a, and a compensation committee, Leo says, if you actually care about your employees and care about human capital, you should have a board level committee to, to focus attention on, on these issues. Marty, in terms of, of implementing the, the business roundtable statements, what do, what do you see firms doing, what should firms be doing so that in two years, when whoever is president and looks back, they're not going to be able to say, 
fine words in August of 2019, but nothing has changed. Well, companies are caught in the middle of uh, this debate, in effect, and basically they're doing the best they can to try to satisfy the investors who are still looking for regular increases in earnings and uh, uh, the value of, of the stock. The, the problem that business is faced with is on the one hand, uh, the desire to deal with ESG and sustainable long-term investment. On the other hand, trying to satisfy shareholders who continue to uh, be looking for uh, regular increases in earnings and the price of the stock. Uh, that problem is not easily resolved. It's not, uh, no one company has come up with a solution for it. But solutions seem to be on the horizon. Um, in the UK, they just adopted a revised uh, uh, stewardship code for asset managers, uh, institutional investors, that uh, basically require by disclosure uh, and an explanation, if not, um, the investor's position with respect to each of these issues, so on. Um, the, um, in France, um, the government appointed a commission that is reporting tomorrow morning on uh, dealing with activism and dealing with the relationship between uh, companies and their investors in order to facilitate long-term sustainable uh, investment. Uh, I could go on. There are a, a series of uh, efforts being made currently to uh, achieve an accommodation between, and I'll call it the need of investors for um, uh, increase in the value of their investments and the need of companies to really meet these stakeholder uh, objectives. Uh, the investment business, the, the managers of uh, investment funds are in a very competitive business. And it's a business that in large measure focuses on quarterly results. Uh, Take um, the New York University endowment. It's one of the smaller endowments uh, uh, in uh, uh, the university world. It's uh, every quarter uh, the managers of the endowment report to an investment committee of the board of trustees as to uh, the results for that quarter, and it's a comparison with the S&P 500 results, the MSCI results, benchmark results, and so on. And in large measure, uh, the amount of funds that a manager can attract uh, is the product of its competitive uh, results of uh, investment as against the other investors, uh, other asset managers that it's in competition with. So there's the theoretical question and there's the practical question. And uh, the theoretical question uh, cannot be answered without regulation unless, as a practical matter, 
companies and um, asset managers and asset owners embrace a concept of long-term sustainable investment and try to take the pressure mm -hmm. off uh, short-term results. And uh, I don't know whether that will happen or not. Uh, people are trying to effectuate something that would achieve that. Uh, interestingly enough, Hermes Investment Management, not the, not the Thai company, uh, 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 one of the most successful and largest investment management companies on October 28th adopted a new uh, um, uh, stewardship statement in which it embraced uh, long-term sustainable investment and attention to, to ESG uh, matters. So it's out there. Uh, people are working on it, trying to achieve it. Uh, um, I was asked by the World Economic Forum uh, five years ago to develop um, a paradigm that could be um, um, adopted by companies and um, um, asset managers uh, uh, and uh, uh, call it the new paradigm. It's still kicking around. It, still under consideration. Uh, I'm actually trying to encourage the business roundtable and the investor stewardship group here in the U.S. to sit down together and uh, negotiate a paradigm in which uh, the investors are going to uh, give support to companies that are doing a good job in uh, both operations and meeting uh, uh, stakeholder uh, uh, issues. Uh, none of it's easy. Um, none of it's going to happen overnight. And I don't think that legislation is going to happen overnight either. Uh, uh, we're really talking about one of the key fundamental factors of the economy. And we don't have uh, an agreement among the leading economists as the best way to approach this. Um, and um, this really comes down to, to try and simplify it, there are the financial statistical economists, and you can put uh, Friedman and Farmer uh, in that category, they're the behavioral uh, economists, those who look to what's the impact on society, not how much money is being generated and how much profit, but what's <coughs> happening uh, in society. And you can uh, put currently Robert Schiller and uh, Thomas Piketty in that, uh, that group. <coughs> and um, and there are, I'm uh, I'm a behavioral, uh, 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 I wouldn't call myself an economist. I, I accept the behavioral uh, uh, economic theory, not the, uh, not the statistical. Uh, and the same is true in, in legal academia. Uh, um, and uh, there are those who, who view one or the other as um, the answer to, uh, or at least the means to the answers to these questions. Uh, but nobody can be sure sitting here today uh, what's going to happen. But you do have to look at the global economy um, and uh, the question of whether um, uh, competitive market economies can as we go into the future, com compete with state corporatism. And uh, I think the, that, that question will be the dominant question going forward in the next decade or two. And uh, it's not at all clear that the uh, 
the answer to that is um, uh, avoiding Elizabeth Warren's uh, legislation. Uh, so, so implicit in what you're saying is that in the in publicly traded companies, publicly listed companies, the power has moved from the boardroom to the asset managers, to the shareholders. That whatever the flexibility that the business judgment rule gives managers uh, and board members, if the shareholders are short-term focused, they'll have no choice but to be short-term focused. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to push back on that a little bit because I, I help to run a company, United Health Group, and if you look at our performance over the past um, 12, 13 years, we're probably in a class by ourselves. And a lot of those decisions were about heavy capital investment, conscious decisions about trading off quarter to quarter by making those investments. I think the investment community will always respect people who can deploy assets that consistently achieve growth. As long as you lay out a game plan and you execute to your game plan, the problem is this. You can't afford to stub your toe. So, so when you think about these things and you, and you make those hard capital investment decisions, you better know what the hell you're doing because there are consequences if you're unsuccessful. But I, I think that as I, as I look at it, and I, I do a lot of investing in sub-Saharan Africa now, and, and one thing I want to align with is what Marty's saying. I've seen the impact a state own companies showing up on that continent. And it's going to be very, very challenging for U.S. corporations to compete against cheap state-owned corporations with their money. So what we have to do is to attract talented people, reward them, put the wind at their back, so they can be the next generation of extraordinary performance. Because if you can't do that, you can't compete. This notion of quarter to quarter is something, in my view, that is not sustainable. So let me follow up on that, because you're on the board of Carlisle. And Katie, you do a lot of work for Blackstone and KKR, Silver Lake. There's an alternative to public markets. Private equity has made a very big business out of providing a, a more sheltered, but also more demanding environment for, for running businesses. That is to say, more sheltered, you're sheltered from quarter to quarter uh, pressure from shareholders, but you have shareholders who are real owners who will hire, fire you if you don't achieve the goals. What are you hearing in terms of from the, the on the, the private equity side, what are you hearing in terms of the reaction to the business roundtable statement? The, the, this problem that Marty identifies of, of shareholder pressure in public markets, what are you seeing in terms of currently firms that are, view it as better to be in the hands of, of private equity rather than the public markets? So I, I will say, you know, and, and private equity is definitely, you know, viewed as the bad guys by Elizabeth Warren and by many other people in politics today. Um, I think the reaction generally, and you'll note uh, Carlisle, um, the, the chairman of Carlisle, the chairman of Silver Lake were signatories um, to the business roundtable statement. Um, the chairman, C. Schwartz of Blackstone, uh, did not sign on. But ultimately, I think as a general rule, and this applies to, to Blackstone, for example, as well, even though they didn't sign the statement, as I said before, private equity is laser focused on ESG issues. Um, a lot of it has to do with the fact that the thing that keeps them up at night is reputation. And one of the things that we know they're very focused on um, are governance issues at their portfolio companies because the reality is the private equity teams, although they have operational insights and they bring in some members of their organization to help improve operations, you know, they're leaving it to the management to run the company, just like directors of a public company board. They're not day-to-day -day running the company typically, so they care very much about corporate governance. They care about ESG issues in terms of, again, some of it is just reputational, but some of it also goes to value for them. I think what we have 
heard is generally the statement is supported. Again, we are asked the questions by private equity as well as our corporate clients. What does this mean for us in terms of our legal liability? Um, but ultimately, I think, supportive. The other thing I'd like to point out, which impacts private equity, but also corporations generally, in terms of things swinging to it's the shareholders dictating things versus the board, I think that's not necessarily true. Directors are still managing the corporations. You know, you have a lot of activist shareholders, which have an activist shareholder movements, which have driven a lot of bad decisions, a lot of focus on giving money back to shareholders, doing the buybacks, sharehold, shareholder value being the sole focus of the corporation. Having said that, you know, when you look, interestingly, at this council of institutional investors, most of those investors are public pension funds. You know, another thing where you can put pressure on, not to take all the pressure off the corporations and the boards or the private equity, is the fact that these investors are, you know, state pension funds, state retirement funds. These are mostly public money, public trust money. And a lot of these same institutional investors themselves have these policies that talk about um, having fair wages, that talk about giving back to the community, um, et cetera. So I think some pressure can also be brought to bear on the institutional investors. You know, when I'm a strong proponent of private equity, um, part of the reason is that you're shielded from some of these day-to-day -day issues of, of share price. And I got to tell you, that if you can get a little bit of protection against that, you can do extraordinary things inside your enterprise. Even though the metrics, by the way, may be a lot tighter, but they're part of an overall plan and you're not responding to things that are outside your control. Second is this, I know where I sit, we focus a lot around, yes, reputational issues, ESG issues, but also the LPs are focused on many of those issues too, and they matter. So we're really starting to integrate these issues into the day-to-day -day operations of the businesses, and that's the good news. It's when it's one-off that it's very hard to say to a management team, you know, there's an issue that's come across the transom. If you say to them, look, I want to see how you're integrating these issues into your day-to-day -day business operations. They can execute on that. And these issues are becoming a part of the daily operations of these enterprises. And I think within private equity, the pressures may be a little greater because their LPs are far more sophisticated than, general, than generally the, the open market. And so when they raise a priority, trust me, you take note, but you also drill down. The other part about it is remember, the people like Carlisle, the people running those businesses that are acquired or invested in are the same people who are running them the day before, generally speaking, as long as they're productive. I want to open it to questions from, from you guys. Uh, You've been thinking about these issues in your corporations classes, in reading the paper. Uh, we have a microphone so that we can record this. Uh, there's a question here. Mike, if you could, over here. Hi. I'm just wondering, I think you were hinting at it, Professor Rock, um, what you would make of this argument from some who would say that the business roundtable statement and just kind of a move towards stakeholder capitalism in general is kind of shifting the balance of power away from shareholders back to the board. And maybe a more cynical viewpoint would be, well, now the board can kind of do whatever it wants because it's not, you know, it's not tethered to that discipline of the shareholders. And they can kind of justify what they're doing by pointing to these nebulous stakeholders out there in the universe. So how would you respond? Would you just say that that's just pure cynicism, that that's short-sighted, or is there something to that argument? Thank you. Well, it's, not, it, it, it's not actually the, the way it works. Uh, most major public companies, if you look at the 180 companies that sign the uh, Almost all of them uh, have um, uh, 
um, about 20% of their stock held by the index funds, um, the big three, uh, Vanguard, BlackRock, and, and um, State Street. Um, and um, just generally um, among those companies, I think it's a fair statement, uh, uh, about 15 of their uh, uh, shareholders, 15 top shareholders, uh, have a absolute or effective control of the company. So the boards of those companies, the managements of those companies, uh, are trying to communicate with those shareholders regularly, trying to make sure they understand the company's strategy, the company's operations, that they're not surprised by changes and expectations and so on. Uh, the power has shifted to uh, what I'll call the institutional investor. And uh, uh, if you just look at Fidelity, Capital, T. Rowe Price, and Vanguard, uh, BlackRock, and State Street, you're, you're basically looking at uh, more or less practical control of all the major listed companies. So um, when it's a question of power and the influence, um, it clearly, one of the key things that's happened, and Professor Rock mentioned it in the opening, we've had this shift over time uh, to where um, big uh, professional investment managers have a much greater voice than uh, shareholders generally did. And you're really talking about how do you deal with those uh, shareholders. Uh, in Professor Rock's class this Monday, uh, Matt Mallow, who is a senior person at BlackRock, um, was the guest, and he's the co-author of a leading article on engagement, engagement between a company and the, its investors. And I personally think that the key to getting a, a modus vivendi that really works between uh, companies and, uh, and shareholders is to have effective engagement mm -hmm. so that the intense pressure that comes about from either activism or the stock market collapsing when there's a disappointment in quarterly earnings, which uh, is heavily felt by the directors. At, and if we could solve that, I think we've solved the uh, need for a less volatile, a more tranquil relationship between companies and, and their investors. And that's, I, that's what I think has to be the focus going forward. Uh, it's not easy to solve, but if you solve that, I think you solve most of the other problems of this type. Katie or Tony, you want to respond to the question? I, I was just saying, I, I think the answer to the question is um, the, yes. Actually, the Council for Institutional Investors statement said exactly that. Oh, well, you're saying you have accountability to all these different stakeholders. That means you have accountability to no one. We want you only to have accountability to the shareholders. I think it is an attempt to try and rest away that focus only on institutional investors and stakeholders. I mean, interestingly, you know, the chair, chair of BlackRock was a signatory to uh, the statement as well, um, but to try and bring it back to the boards and have them be able to have a more broad focus. Um, I mean, in terms of the quarterly earnings, many people have talked about whether um, quarterly earnings releases should be eliminated to alleviate some of the short-term profit um, focus on corporations, allow them to execute more long-term strategic plans without getting punished for a dip in quarterly earnings. I think it definitely remains to be seen whether these institutional investors and others will feel like that, you know, having less information is sufficient for them, who also feel like they have duties um, to their own investors. 
We had another question over here. Hi. <clears throat> Sorry. Thank you. Um, several examples given by Professor Lipton as to solutions on the horizon relate to actions undertaken by the UK and French government. Uh, given that I personally come from a country whose de facto authoritarian government legislates and executes at the snap of a finger, I'm wondering to what extent the partisan nature of American politics will hinder such solutions from being implemented. And if so, can large corporations work to implement changes on their own? So the, the, to what extent is, is our current polarized political system uh, a barrier to, to, uh, to the kind of government-led, or at least self-regulatory organization-led solutions that we see in France and the UK, for instance, the Financial Reporting Council? Uh, well, I think can I take a step? <laughs> I think in this instance, right. polarization is not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You know, I... I think changes need to be thought out. And I don't think the government is the place where you go and say, we have a complex issue in the society and we want you to regulate it. I think what you want to be able to do is to say, we were responsible for the creation of opportunities in the society are looking at these issues, we've come to some consensus, let us share with you how we think we can execute because you, the government, are not in a position to execute. All you can do is to drop some regulations and hope for the best. So I look at it and say, in this instance, polarization is a good thing. It, so, it's, uh, it, also, uh, I may have misled you uh, the uh, commission in France uh, was uh, a basically uh, uh, companies, law firms, um, the uh, AMF there, SEC, uh, was a, uh, uh, a kind of a, uh, an adjunct to it and so on. It was essentially not a government um, organization it was it and its recommendations are basically um, uh, mostly for self-regulation with um, only one of the ten basic recommendations being one uh, for uh, legislation the same is true in the UK uh, uh, financial reporting council has quasi governmental power but they uh, the decisions there are decisions that are the result of consultation with uh, the industry and the companies and, and so on. So um, uh, those methods of dealing with this work rather well. Uh, the, uh, the introduction of a bill that has been drafted in a senator's office uh, with some academic help from Cornell uh, uh, is a different story. Maybe if the academic help is <laughs> you will come out there. But, but much, much different much story. <laughs> but uh, be that as it may, uh, uh, there's a big difference between uh, associations no. doing this and the Investor Stewardship Group, which I mentioned, was formed uh, because of dissatisfaction with the uh, Council of Institutional Investors, which basically represents public pension funds and uh, union pension funds and uh, the uh, more public uh, uh, major investors thought it wasn't adequately representing all investors, and that's why it was formed. Uh, and it today has, uh, when exercised, a much stronger voice than the Council of Institutional Investors. We are unfortunately out of time. Please join me in thanking our wonderful panelists.